Uh, I am an assistant professor of digital media arts at the uh, uh, at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. And my specialty is in game studies, which means I research games and write about games and games culture, but I also make games as sort of a private practice. Uh, you can play my games for free on my website, which is skylorel.net. And a lot of my games are about communicating ideas because my background is in the field of communication. But uh, in general, I just love games and I've been playing games most of my life and I love talking about games. And so I, I hope to nerd out over the next hour with my colleague, Kat. How about you, Kat? Awesome. Hi, I'm Kat Schreier. I am an associate professor and director of a gaming program. Um, it's the Games and Emerging Media program at Marist College, a university in the New York metro area. And I'm also consulting as a game designer for the World Health Organization right now. Prior to becoming a full-time professor, I also worked at places like Nickelodeon, Scholastic, and Brain Pop, working on educational games. And so my focus has really been on games and learning and also using games for empathy and compassion and ethics and civic engagement. So um, one of my recent books, um, We the Gamers, is about using games to teach ethics and civics. I've uh, written or co-edited or created in some way over 100 different articles on games and learning, um, some of which you could check out on karenschreier.com if you're interested. And I'm so excited to be talking to you today. So, Kat, uh, we should talk about accessibility. What is, what is accessibility? Yeah, you could go for it. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I, have some, I, I was looking through our, the questions we had planned to ask each other and I, I was taking some notes, but oh, if I say something that sort of like spurns a thought, feel free to just interrupt me sure. and hop in. Uh, so accessibility really as a term gets its roots in disability advocacy uh, because it, it was a term used to describe literally physically accessing spaces like getting into buildings and up floors or getting access to places within certain spaces uh and so as disability advocates which primarily consisted of people with disabilities uh they are uh people with disabilities were their primary advocates uh they have created this idea that uh, by the removal of barriers, both physical and metaphorical, um, people with disabilities as well as people without disabilities can benefit. So uh, a classic example of this is a ramp that goes into a building. I'll, on my campus, there's a lot of buildings and they all have ramp access. And I can tell you that I have walked up those ramps many of time, many times, say I'm moving into my office, I'm carrying heavy boxes, or if my, uh, my, my little infant daughter is, is with me, I can push her in the stroller. But it, in, it gives me access to that building. But speaking more metaphorically, uh, I Uh, what do you what do you think, Kat? Anything to add about what accessibility is? No, I think that you're definitely talking about um, accessibility. Like that is historically what it's been about, right? It's been about, like you said, removing obstacles to participation, whether it's in a building, whether it's in a designed experience like a game, whether it's in an institution, right? So we think about our institutions and how accessible they are. So. Like to me, accessibility is about belonging. It's about feeling like you can belong because the environment has been designed for you. And it's like everybody feels like they belong. And so that often means designing for those people who are most marginalized from an experience rather than for like the majority. So it's not like about like the one size fits all mentality, but it's really about designing for um, the people that have those have barriers, right? Or maybe historically have been systemically excluded, right? So designing for for those that are m most marginalized, because then it really will be more the most accessible for everyone, and so. That means to me designing with care and connection and inclusion at the forefront as like the number one 
goal rather than just designing for like this one size fits all functionality. Um, and so that's so, like a lot of times what happens is like, and this even happens like in like the school board meetings, right? So like we have these school board meetings where like there's been a lot of issues with the way that our school has been handling um, kids with autism. Crippling, but at the same time, it's part of what we go through every day. Like, and, and, you know, in ways like, you know, that they shouldn't have been, like, been treated horribly. And so there's been a lot of, of advocacy around, you know, when you're designing for a, designing a system or designing a school or designing a game for the people who are most marginalized, it actually benefits everyone. And so a lot of times people think that, oh, if you're just designing for the people that are most marginalized, well... That's not for me, but it's actually the uh, the opposite is true. Then it then it's it's better for everybody. Everybody benefits from it, and so um, you know. And so I think about that like with games, right? That you know, when we have more people able to access the content in a game, or or to represent themselves in a game, like I think about um, a game like In the Valley of Gods, right? That was like one of the first games that really tried to represent type four hair, which is like that tightly coiled hair um, type that a lot of black women have. And it's not usually represented in game. And having that ability to represent yourself, to express your own self, that is accessibility to me, right? Having your hair texture represented in a game or like your sexual identity, right? Like you think about a game like Dragon Age, which was like one of the first games to really start to show, you know, okay, you can have, you can express yourself in different ways, your gender identity, your sexual identity, and you can, you can have, build relationships based on what you're most interested in. Um, And, you know, that was a big, you know, those, you know, it's not just about removing barriers to me, it's about actually actively including different perspectives and different, different ways of expressing humanity, right? It's really about about showing the stories that we have, we all have, and, and expressing that through through play. It sounds like accessibility really, ta- and especially when it comes to video games, really takes on this dual function. And uh, I don't know if function is the right word, where uh, it is accessibility in terms of like design and mechanics in terms of who has like physical access to receiving the audio visual information from a game and then inputting commands into a game, yeah. as well as who do we culturally, who do we include yeah. in this space? Because all media is culture and it's motivated yeah. by culture and it expresses culture. Mm-hmm. So who who is welcome into this space of gaming? Which is something I wanna talk about maybe later in our discussion or maybe we can talk yeah. about it right now is uh, perhaps one of the biggest barriers to increasing accessibility in gaming is a cultural barrier. Oh, uh, yeah. This is not necessarily a design barrier. Oh, yeah. It's, I, I mean, I 100% agree with that, right? Because you think about, you know, I always say, like, like you were talking about obstacles, like, one of the biggest obstacles is ourselves, right? Our own culture, not just, like, the culture of, like, the game developers. And certainly there's an issue with that, right? Like, you look back... 2014 Ubisoft saying, oh, we don't want to, you know, include a female character. It's too hard to design in their latest Assassin's Creed. Do you remember that? They were like, it's too difficult. And like, no. Forgotten about that, which is so funny. Yeah. I mean, stuff like that. Sure. There's definitely like that mentality, right? That, you know, we don't want to have to design for everyone. We want to design for our quote unquote target audience, right? And that's it. And they're the ones that make the money and we just want them. And they're not, they don't understand their target audience. Or, you know, I've heard, you know, when I used to work in the games industry, I would talk to people all the time and they would say, well, my company designs for, you know, the women games, like the match three and like the cooking games. And they would disparage their own audience, right? They would look down on their own audience. So certainly there is a cultural barrier in the game development community, but I would say there's also the barrier of just the public understanding what games can do, right? So there's stigma around games, right? They're seen just as like these violent, addictive experiences rather than what they can be, which is also just 
this, you know, the possibilities of showing all these different kinds of stories and showing, being able to express ourselves in all these different ways. Like I think about a game like When Rivers Were Trails, right? It's a game about the uh, Anishinaabe people who um, during um, the allotment acts of the late 1800s were removed from their lands. Um, these in indigenous peoples were, were moved um, from their lands in the United States. And this game shows us what that was like. It brings us, it gives us access to a historical moment that normally we would not have access to. It gives us access to a viewpoint and a perspective. Like, sure, we cannot fully understand what it was like to be someone who was moved from their land, um, you know, in the late 1800s, but we could at least get um, a taste of that. We can get, you know, some bit of access to that viewpoint. And that to me is the power of games. Like they, they can give us access to these facets of humanity, these facets of history, these facets of life that normally we would never be able to participate in. And we can make, and like when we're in a game, we could actively perform. We can actively take on these perspectives. We can actively make decisions and make choices that are meaningful. And, you know, it's, you know, so that to me is like that, that's access, right? That's also access, right? And that, that's powerful. And that, and the cultural barrier of not seeing games for what they are is, is huge, right? And that's something we oh. all need to move past. There, there's also this cultural barrier among players themselves that I see sometimes even in my own game design students uh, to this inclination towards gatekeeping games. Yes. Yes. And I know you and Kat, both, and both of us uh, are in agreement that games should be welcoming places. Mm -hmm. They should be inclusive. You've used the word cozy before, which I like. Yes. But if I say that word among my game design students, if I use language like that, mm -hmm. at least one student, if not more than one student, really like whinges yeah. at like that phrase. Mm -hmm. And then like I get some... Oh, yeah. And I like that they give pushback yeah. and we have a conversation yeah. about like what that means and it's like well and uh, for instance one student was like well I, I want like certain games to be gatekeepers I want certain yeah. games to be only like completed by yeah. really avid skilled players and when I try to push them on it and ask uh, well I try to push them on them and ask what why why do you what what harm do you go through by allowing other people to finish this game yeah. and and uh, he didn't really have a good answer because I just think a lot of players haven't thought critically through those answers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. You were going to say yeah. something. I mean, I, I think you're hundred percent right. I actually did the scheme jam with my students, which was about identity. And I saw that, you know, so most of the player, most of the people there. So a game jam is basically this event where you make a game, like you have like 48 hours or 24 hours and you have to create a game in this short amount of time. And you usually give them a theme. And the theme that we gave was identity. You have to make a game related to your own identity or expressing someone else's identity. And I found that like 13 to 14% of the participants in that game jam were really like against just the theme, like just having to make a game about identity because they don't, they they don't want to let other identities into there. It's not, that's not important to them to either want to learn about identity or to want other identities expressed through games. It there's resistance. Like you said, there's resistance. And I think it's about power. You know, you have, you have, it's your space. This is my space. Like I'm, I'm the owner of the space and I don't want to let other people in. And it's, um, you know, you could broaden that to like borders that we have in our country and deciding who gets the gatekeeping of letting people in. And then you could look at our institutions, right? Our, whether it's our civic institutions or like who gets to vote and how do we keep people out of voting? And it's, those are the same, I mean, you're seeing the like, games, you can also look at games as communities and you could see how people respond to that, right? Your, your student not wanting certain people into their community, right? It's, it's the same, you know, we're, we're seeing that um, in all areas of our lives. And, and that my question is always like, how do we get to those people who are most resistant? And I don't know, you know, I don't know how to get to those people. 
I wish I had an answer because that's that's like the key. Like, how do we reach those people? Right. Like, and I, I you know, and, and uh, we're educators. And so we're in a spot where we can sort of we're, we're given permission to critically engage uh, with our students about these topics. But more generally, and uh, because because the nature of this this con uh, so much is focused on fan communities and fandom. I, 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 I gotta say, I am impressed with how some fandom communities have taken it upon themselves to make the, uh, the media around which their fan community circulates a, a welcoming place, a more inclusive space. So I, I am proud of that. Well, I'm not so proud of, of other spaces, of course, <laughs> which, which makes me at wonder. And I'll, and I'll ask you, Kat, uh, that, Regarding accessibility, both in terms of design and mechanics, as well as culture and inclusion, uh, what are the things that we can do, mm. practically speaking, yeah. to make both sides of this accessibility discussion in, improved? And so to start, for mm. instance, when I'm, when I'm teaching my students about designing games uh, and including and, and keeping accessibility in mind from a design perspective and building accessibility into your game from the ground up. One thing that I teach them is that, look, you, you can't do, you can't do everything. You have like six weeks to build your final project games. Yeah. And in practicality, when you're making games in real life, perhaps you can't make a perfectly accessible game. And I think that's a huge barrier to giving people permission to engage in accessibility is that they feel since they can't make a perfectly accessible game that they shouldn't even try. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing that I teach my students is like, look, let's let's look at this as just a ground floor approach, a, a ground floor approach, and I use that metaphor intentionally because of the history of accessibility and getting access to a ground floor of a building. Mm -hmm. Like, what are the things that are like bare essential, mm -hmm. like ethically, to include in even the smallest of games? Mm -hmm. And I, I argue, at least in my in my classes, that it is button remapping should be just yeah. universal in every game because it's so simple to implement if you work on it from the ground up. Uh, visual clarity, subtitles for any spoken language, and and this is the part where I get the most pushback, a, some sort of control or management of difficulty settings, which yeah. is, which is it's a, that's, difficulty is a hard conversation to have with people who love games. But it's a conversation worth having. I'm wondering what are your thoughts, Kat, about what are sort of the the practical things we can do to improve yeah. accessibility, both mechanically, but also culturally. Yeah. I mean, I would, you know, there's a, there are a lot of tools out there that are excellent in thinking through this. Like the able gamers charity has this amazing, yeah, they have this like yeah. APX design patterns that you can like click on and you can see all of these different great ideas about how to incorporate um, accessibility into your game design. And so I would say like, start there, you know, if you're, if you're able to, right. If you're able to, um, you know, beyond what you said, like if you have the resources and you have the time, that's where I would start, you know, asking yourself those questions, looking at that, um, looking at that tool. But I would also say, like you said, like culturally, like I would, I would argue like, okay, like who, who's on your team, right? Like who are, who's even like, you start like, like are, is your team diverse? Like, are you including different perspectives in your, um, like who has the power to make your own game, right? Is it like, who has the decision-making power? Who has the, you know, creative control? Um, if you're on the team with like five people, is it just like the programmers deciding things? Because like people like, somehow think that the programmers have this power because of just the fact that they can write code in some way or or are you giving are you realizing that everybody on to have like that shared you know shared power that it's not just the programmers who are like the gods right that we're worshiping but that there's you know just as much the design you know the game designers the producers the artists um, sound, sound design, all of that matters too, right? And so, you know, thinking about, you know, if you're on a team where it's like there's different gender identities, is it only the men who are making the decisions or are the women, you know, and the non-binary people also making those decisions? And, 
or you know do you have like are you just making something that is focused on a very like cis you know hetero kind of male mentality or are you like expanding that beyond um you know or even just like like united states like are you thinking about things globally are you thinking about things like different sexual identities and different racial identities and including those voices on the team in the begin to begin with right so there's so many ways that we can you know just from the very start you know just having those different voices on your team having people make those design design decisions based on you know their backgrounds and their um you know are you are you allowing for different kinds of avatars are you allowing for different kinds of stories are you allowing for different kinds of ways of thinking about the world um yeah i i would say like start there but the um the able gamers charity is like a really like if you're talking about like physical and 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 um you know different kinds of accessibility in terms of like neurodiversity and and that i mean a, you know different kinds of um a bit, you know that able gamers apx cards are really really good so I would definitely start there for like really practical ideas. I, I love Able Gamers and also the the website. Can I play that? Because yes, uh, bo yes. both are you are performing these really essential functions for increasing accessibility in games and, and gaming culture. And I this is a complete aside, but we have the time to go on asides. I think. <laughs> yeah, um, How much time do we have? By the way, <laughs> I, I think we have until twelve fifty. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Unless well, uh, twelve fifty for me, it's one fifty. Got it. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm 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 on I'm on Central Time. That's right. It's like yeah, like you have to. <laughs> but, but I, I uh, in this project that I'm I'm working on right now, I, I have the chance to do these interviews with members of game culture and game designers and game journalists. Um, and uh, as part of this project, I'm I'm editing down and pr just publishing these interviews. Uh, so people get uh, get to like hear from these voices, and uh, I was able to interview uh, Stephen Spawn, uh, who co-founded Able Gamers, and hearing his uh, story about like fighting for accessibility in games was fascinating. And he was talking, telling me how like he would go to these game conventions, and he's a wheelchair user and he has a ventilator, uh, breathing apparatus, uh, and he would he would literally go up to representatives from like Blizzard or Ubisoft, and he'd be like, "Hey, I see that you're releasing this game." could I play this game? Mm. And uh, at first they would just turn them away and <laughs> just like, yeah. not even like, like they, they would, they, uh, the idea of including uh, players with disabilities yeah. was just an anathema to them. Like why even, why would yeah. you even think that? Like you're definitely not our audience. But then the way Steven describes it is that like, yo, like we have money, like <laughs> we want to play games and we want to spend yeah. money on games. And uh, so uh, he advocated and worked really hard, and now he's on like first name speaking terms with all of these different companies. He's this monumental voice in, yeah. in game accessibility. You mentioned uh, neurodiversity, and I just it's it's because I, I I'm obsessed with this, and that's why I keep coming back mm -hmm. to it. Can can we talk about difficulty yeah. in games a little bit, and uh, also? Uh, ages of players because oftentimes mm -hmm. games are presupposed to be played by a certain age of players yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, one thing that I, I talk about in my game design class is uh, about the benefits or perhaps the importance of thinking about players uh, who, in older age brackets or even younger age brackets yeah. how it's important mm -hmm. yeah. to not ignore the fact that a significant chunk of the human population are children yeah and including like my full, like my now five year old, right? So, yeah. I, like including access, uh, uh, thinking about accessibility in games yeah. and difficulty as a way of like including my then four year old when I set him up with Mario Kart, and the yeah. most Mario Kart has these amazing accessibility options where you can uh, set up uh, tilt steering and then automated automatic acceleration and making sure you don't go off the track and always go in the right direction. With that, he was able to play, like I think at the latter end of age three. And the point I try to make, at least with my students, is that that that's not a bad thing. Yeah, it's, it yeah. is a competitive game. There are winners yeah. and losers in that game, but yeah. no one loses by allowing my three-year-old to play it. Similarly, with the the 
the sort of big push in casual games with the, the Nintendo Wii and the Wiimote and motion controls, that introduced yeah. gaming to an entire segment of older populations, too, who yeah. never really were like considered as a viable audience for games, but they were yeah. like, they're playing their Wii Bowling, man, and just killing it. Uh, I know you have kids. Uh, what yeah. are your thoughts about like designing games yeah, for people of different I mean, ages? Yeah. First of all, I hope that when I am older, I can still play games. Yes. So they, better, they better be making games because I'm going to be playing them. And certainly my grandmother, who was like, you know, almost in her 90s, was playing video games when she was older. And, you know, this is that's what I'm, I plan on it, so make, yeah. make some games for me. Um, but yeah, I have I have a bunch of kids, um, you know, all different ages. One is just turned two, so he's not quite there yet with the playing of games. But um, when my my six year old is um, developmentally disabled, and he has like per, in particular fine motor or skill coordination issues, like he really um, just his not able to like manipulate things in the way that um, even a six year old could do. And so, but he's able to play games because, you know, they're, they have different levels of, you know, like super smash brothers. He can play on, you know, the like easiest, le you know, level and he can just keep playing over and over again. And like actually like doing those games is helping also him, him like get better with the fine motor skills. Yes. Like, he's able to, yes. Like, like even though, right. Like, I mean, it's like actually like helping like him practice that because nothing else, like he doesn't want to like do other things. Like you want to play with clay or, um, you know, right over and over again. Like that's not interesting to him, but it is interesting for him to play super smash. Even if he loses like a hundred times, at least he's like, engaged in that and so it's helping him manipulate things in a way that he wouldn't normally do so um so games can actually like help in that way and then my daughter like when she was like five or six she like was starting to play video games and she'd always play on the like tutorial level like i remember there was like a, a super mario brothers that had like this little like you could click, I forget which one it was, but you click on it and it goes ding, ding. And then you like, you can't lose. Like you can play on this, you know, you, you just, you practice and you keep practicing and now she can play it. No, she doesn't need the tutorial levels anymore. She's nine and she can like finish the whole game in like five minutes, you know? So, but it's like, it helped her to practice enough, like over and over again so that she couldn't like lose. So she wouldn't get so frustrated. Right. But then she kept going and it, it supported her in that way. And so, like, not only was she able to play, but she was able to learn. And, like, I think about that, like, in terms of learning, like, having that kind of scaffolding is helping us to learn, helping my son to learn how to use, like, his fine motor, you know, to refine his fine motor skills, but also my daughter to learn how to play this game. Could that be used in so many other ways, right? Could we be doing that in our schools, can we learn from games and the way that they are allow it for accessibility um, and engagement? Like, could we learn from that? I, I really think challenge in games is overrated. It's overvalued <laughs> significantly. No, and I, I have some excellent case studies. Like, I remember playing my play, my OG PlayStation, right, as a teenager, and I played this fantastic game called uh, Driver. Mm. I don't know if you remember it. I, I didn't play Driver, although I, I probably would like to. Uh, it's just, a, it's like a little, high, it's just a driving game, a uh, heist yeah. game, uh, and in it, like with a lot of those older games, they had the cheat codes, right? You put in mm -hmm. some inputs, and then you have like invincibility, or you can right. like make your car extra bouncy, or make your car go extra fast, and other yeah. things. And a bunch of games had a bunch yeah, of these like options. Sim City, I remember like, yeah. like, like there was like the, I think it was Some City. you had, you can get like the 999, never, you know, or you get like, like, so much money that you can use yeah. anything and yeah and honestly i that never distracted from that experience for me no. by removing the challenge in that game i right. just loved playing it it was one of my favorite games yeah. and in my in my recent my the, the game design class that i just wrapped up uh in their game uh, we also had a game jam and in that uh part part of going into that game jam is that i require students to include certain accessibility ideas oh. built into the games Thanks. Um, such as but, uh, full button remapping, because again, it is so easy to implement mm -hmm. if you just do it at the start of your game. But uh, one thing that I advise them to do is that 
add options, toggles in your game so that you can adjust the the difficulty or the challenge of the game. So we were de- we were showcasing the games and this one team got up and was showcasing their game and they actually couldn't get par- past a certain part of their own game yeah. when show- showing their game. So they went and they turned on the toggle <laughs> for like invincibility and like infinite jumps. <laughs> and then I kid you not, they started playing the game and it was so fun to yeah. play with those things on. And we were la- we were all laughing and it was a lot of fun. And so I, yeah. and uh I, I see as like young designers their their go to because uh because this is how they've been trained by playing games, yeah. their go to like design approach is is challenge. So they'll add timers mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. these game over states. But I kid you not, there's a reason why Stardew Valley is so fucking successful, is that you can't yeah. lose in that game. Yeah. Uh, so I see that challenging games is just this overrated value. Yeah. And so if you don't want to have like adjustable difficulty options in games, just I would I would advise designers to just think about how like maybe just remove challenge. It is a it can be That's really, really fun. Yeah, I mean the challenge could also be like how much you open yourself up as a human to a game, right? I mean that could be the challenge. Like I think of a game like kind words right i don't know if you've played kind words no, i haven't it's, tell me about it yeah it's just a game where you like write letters to anonymous people and then a few days later they write back to you and so for example like i i remember when i was playing it i was writing my book we the gamers and i was like i'm you know i just wrote like i'm really nervous like i'm writing this book it's like really hard you know to write a book like i don't know if it's good enough like i'm super nervous like i just spilled my guts out, you know, the challenge of like expressing yourself. I sent it out that that letter to, to the to the anonymous people. And then like a few days later, I got back like really nice kind letters of support, like you can do it, you're awesome, like you can get this book done, you're gonna be great. Like it was like cheerleading letters. And then like people would also like I could read letters from other people and I could respond to them. And so like some people had like problems with their girlfriend or they had problems with their parents. Like I remember like one of them was like, oh, like my parent just like doesn't let me, (laughs) doesn't wanna let me out, you know, doing stuff like, you know, uh, I'm like frustrated and it was like, It was like, you know, giving that like perspective, like as a parent, like, oh, you know, I'm sure your parent loves you and like trying to give like that back. And so like the challenge, there's no challenge, right? There's no like supposed challenge, right? You're not like leveling up. You're not like trying to write the best letter ever. You're just like trying to express yourself. And like that in in and of itself could be like challenging, right? right? To be like to be like honest and to like share your truth, you know, like to share the fact that you're struggling. I mean, to me that those are like challenges, like that's like a challenge to be like, I am having a problem and I need to like tell people about that. Um, And that is like, to me, like meet, you know, meet that challenge like that, you know, that that's where games I think could challenge us, right? To be ourselves, like to be our true, honest, expressive selves. And I, you know, I think of like games like Kind Words and I think about other games like that Dragon Cancer. And there's another game that just came out. I haven't played it yet, but it sounds really interesting. It's called Before Your Eyes. It's about a child with a chronic illness. Like that truth about like trauma and like the real like, like things that we all go through, like the traumas that we're all experiencing in different ways, like to give truth to that, like that to me is like a power of games that, you know, that's, that's the challenge. Like, not like you said, like the timers and, you know, there's like a little monster out here and like, yeah, you gotta yeah. jump this high. And just and endless and game over things. states that make you restart over and over and over again. Yeah. Like you have to Ugh. keep doing it. Like, I look when I was like nine and ten, like I love, I love to have, like you know the frustration and like you have to keep going and and like there's something to that and that's a that's a type of gameplay and I accept that. But there's so many other ways that like we can be challenged as humans and that games can share those challenges with us. That um, is not like a, it's like a different approach to challenge, I guess. Like just being like honest and being generous. And being kind, 
you know, sometimes it's hard to do that, right? I mean, when you're, when you're overwhelmed, when you're stressed, like I, like I was telling you, Sky, like I just had surgery, you know, two days ago, I'm like in severe pain, I can't move, you know, it's like, that's, those are challenges, right? And like, I'm, you know, trying to meet the challenge of just like being present, right? Of being in that enthusiastic when I'm like fighting through pain, right? I mean, that's like, those are challenges, right? And Games can games can share that with the world. They, they, I, I I agree. There are these unique spaces where I, I feel like we're only barely starting to scratch the surface about their expressive capabilities, yeah. and so much of that has to do with thinking about games as terms of tests of skill. Which, like, I won't like. I love Dark Souls. I love Dark Souls, man. I was just telling <laughs> you before we chat. Like, I recently replayed it when yeah. I was recovering from my own, like, medical procedure, yeah. right? Like, tests of skill, fantastic. But, yeah. like, if that's all you're thinking games are, yeah. you're missing out on a whole realm, like, a realm of yeah, expressive so possibilities. Yeah. Speaking of which, Kat, I want to talk about your games. My uh, game. Yeah, game, or talk about, like, game creation in general. Yeah. Because I, okay. uh, yeah. in your own game creation practice yeah. in the past or more recently, mm-hmm. how has accessibility shown itself? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question because I, like, I'm like struggling with this right now because like, like right now I'm trying to design a virtual reality game for uh, youth in Nigeria and um, it's uh, to help Nigerian youth understand what it's like to be um, from another ethnic group. So in Nigeria, there's over 200 different ethnic groups and there's still like a lot of tensions among them. There was like a civil war not too long ago and there's just um, a lot of misunderstandings and biases uh, about Emma. other groups. And Maroon and so like what we're doing, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm not Nigerian, um, but Maroon everybody else 14. on the team is Nigerian. And uh, but I am the one who has a game design background. So I am, um, you know, we're creating this game where you, let's say you're, there's like, we're starting with like four of the main ethnic groups. So like Hausa, Igbo, Yoruba, Niger Delta. If you are Yoruba, you would play, for example, as someone who's Hausa, right? And you would go through this VR experience and like ex- like understand like, okay, like these people are discriminating against me and you, you'd experience that. And you would, um, you know, understand that that story, and then, well, you know, or your Ebo, and you would play as someone who's Yoruba, and and we were trying to like test to see if like does your empathy and your compassion toward someone who's from another ethnic group change because you've had this experience in a game, and and so like I'm like writing the script, but I don't really, you know, again, like I don't know Nigerian like culture, so it's. Basically, like, I'm writing the game and the script for it. And then my Nigerian team were working together to then, like, really, like, it's still in English, but it's, like, translating it culturally to make it accessible to Nigerian youth, right? So, so like, I'm not, I'm not going to understand that culture, right? So it has to be accessible and it has to be inclusive of that culture, and of the and of that ethnicity, so we're you know our team is um, like really like translating it culturally to that, and then we test, we do pilot testing, we you know we test with Nigerian youth, um, we're, we've been working doing game jams with Nigerian to try to understand their needs and understand how they want to tell their own stories, right? So there's like all these different ways that we're doing this, um, but like it's it's hard because like. We don't know if it's going to work, you know, it might not work. And, you know, you test and you retest and, you, and then there's like, there's studies that have shown that it doesn't always work, right? There's like the study of a virtual reality game about a person who, you know, you play as someone who's in a wheelchair and like, you think like, oh, like their compassion is going to be so much higher if they understand what it's like to be in a wheelchair. But what the researchers found actually was that while people like, felt more compassion and understanding towards someone in a wheelchair. There was also more stigma and then they were less likely to then talk to someone who was in a wheelchair because they felt so emo- yeah, because they- What? Yeah, because they felt so emotionally overwhelmed by it. It was uh. like it was like so much for them that they were almost like like um 
like they were like oh gosh like they felt like almost helpless like, so that that like, game went a little too hard maybe yeah, it was like <laughs> they were like this is so they were like this is so awful like this is so you know i feel so bad for this person they Oof. felt bad Not but they also the felt questions? like they also felt like well i don't want to talk to them Are because i mean one? it's like a strange thing right yeah I thought this I was phenomenon that. that you could go too far, that you can be too emotionally involved and it could overwhelm you. Yeah. Like there's this game, um, Journey to the Camps, okay? And it's about like, okay, so you're, it's a VR game and you're going on this train or on this bus and you're going to like the concentration camps, right? So it's, and you're feeling you're hearing the sounds, the clanks, and people are yelling at you, and you're experiencing all of this. And then you get to a point where you're at the camps, and then like you're at like these sh- like you're about to take a shower, and like you hear like the hissing, and like all of a sudden, then the water's God. Down. okay. And there are people who are playing this that were like this is too much for me, and then they had to stop playing because it was emotionally overwhelming them to play this game about being in. A, you know, going to a concentration camp and being in, it was like, they stopped playing. Like, if you stop, if it's too much emotionally and you stop playing, is that, is that beneficial? Or is right. it that you can't play? It's because it's, you I know, mean, you so there's this balance, the right? The bad and the ugly, you get too emotionally too. overwhelmed and too, it's too much to experience someone else's discrimination to, or to experience their pain, then it might, you know, th- you might have empathy for them, but you can't, you can't do anything with that because you're overwhelmed, right? So empathy isn't always beneficial in some ways, right? It sometimes it it's not. It, you don't take that action necessarily. You have to feel safe and you have to feel um, almost empowered enough to be able to do that. And when you're emotionally overwhelmed, you're not thinking. You're overwhelmed yourself, right? So so there's this always this balance, like as a game designer, like when I'm thinking about game design. I have to always balance all of these different things and we're still learning. There's, there's not much out there about this. And so I'm trying to do the research so that we can figure out like, what's the right balance. And what I love about your example is that it's intensely practical. Like you are making this game for an audience. So yes. this is not a hypothetical. And so no, it's a really, it's, yeah. it's a really good example simple. of how yeah. accessibility more, very broadly just means so much it mean it means yeah. it means including making a game so say emotionally affecting that it prohibits gameplay which i have yeah. absolutely seen not only just in in say less purpose driven games uh also mm-hmm. just like games where uh either they get too frustrating mm-hmm. or or otherwise are just too emotionally engaging yeah. uh, oh. i know when i'm making <clears throat> my games uh i I, I'm always like on a quest to demonstrate that if you are thinking about accessibility as like a gr- like as a principle as like a mm-hmm. perspective from the start of a project, mm-hmm. it uh, like that's how accessibility happens instead of trying to like tack it on. Yeah, and so yeah. oftentimes we'll see major games released and they'll be like, oh, the subtitles aren't very good. They'll try to patch things or mm-hmm. they'll add accessibility features yeah. after the fact. But what I'm trying to convey with my students and with the my own games is that it, it's a way it's a design approach mm-hmm. uh that if you are thinking about it from the very beginning your design is just improved for everybody mm-hmm. like i was i had my students do this game jam and as sort of a surprise i didn't tell them but i participated in the game jam as well now they're on teams of four and i just did it by myself so i just kind of wanted to flex on them and like let them know that i'm a better designer than they are uh but not really i'm sure they're amazing designers uh But also I wanted to show that by taking on that perspective, you can make a game that is perhaps more accessible than it would have otherwise been if you just started from the beginning. So the Game Jam theme was good, better, best. And so the idea was you had to express like three states, like a good state, a better state, and a best state. And it could be like game over, it could be endings, it could be whatever, or three different ways of playing. And so with uh, with this game, I made it kind of like 1950s horror movie kitsch mm-hmm. themed. It was about a blob eating people. Uh, and I found this really, really cool CRT TV effect online that I could download and like add to the game to make it like staticky and cool. Mm-hmm. But as soon as I added it, because I had this perspective in mind, I made sure to immediately add a toggle at the beginning of the game so players can turn that off. 
yeah. because it, it limits visual accessibility, right? Yeah. Now, if people mm -hmm. want to play with that, fantastic. Also, mm -hmm. oh, with controlling the game, I designed the game to be a mouse-controlled game, but because if this, with accessibility as a, like, a founding principle, I know that I need to give different controlling options, and one of the best ways you can do it is if it's a mouse-based game is to find a way to allow players to play it on their keyboard, because keyboards mm -hmm. are easy to remap. And so the very first thing you do at the game is there's a little disclaimer saying this game is designed to be played with a mouse. However, mm -hmm. some players may find that difficult. If that's the case, select like keyboard controls instead. Hmm. And uh, and it didn't take that that it, that took honestly minutes of my time yeah. versus trying to like if I had designed the game to completion and then tried to tack this on at the end, it's it's yeah. it's meaningless. Yeah. And so I think you would agree with me, Kat, that as we try to teach our game design students or as we try to do outreach with other game scholars or as we interact with game developers or even as we like interact with game fandoms or other like game culture in general, that that the biggest challenge, like we said at the beginning, is that the biggest challenge to accessibility is just cultural. Just pers It's a, a perspective. And teaching yeah. that uh, that accessibility as perspective is not scary. It is not going to ruin your gameplay. It is... It, it only benefits you and everybody else. And so we should just welcome it into mm -hmm. our media creation and media consumption practices. Yes, that is a great way of putting it. Yeah, that was, just, that was just soapboxing yeah. at that point. <laughs> no, I, lo I love the way you put it in. It's like that it benefits all of us. Like it's not, it doesn't take away from someone else, you know, to include everybody. And I think that you're right. I think that people really think somehow that if other people are let in, if other people are allowed um, participation in whatever space we're in, whether it's a or institution of some kind, that that somehow it's going to ruin things, that it's going to change things. But it actually will make everybody, it will lift everyone up. It will make everybody feel like they're having more fun or they're having more engagement or that they care more and that they can be you know that it just it's like you said when you were talking about like everybody was having more fun when they talk the challenge like that's you know everybody will have more fun together yeah. and if you want the challenge you can you can have it yeah right I'm, and that's, I'm into, oh great. sorry don't no i was gonna say that's great yeah i'm because i know that we have just, uh, a few minutes to to hear from participants here in the channel. Uh, I know that there might be questions that they have, but I'm also interested in hearing from their experiences. Yeah. So if any of you have an experience where you uh, benefited from sort of an, access an accessible approach, or if you have uh, your own thoughts on this, I wanna hear like what you have to say too. Like uh, uh, it's just our two perspectives that we shared, but you have your own experiences and with accessibility, and I'd love to hear what those are. And we'd also, I'm sure, love to answer your questions too. Cool. I know that. Sorry. Oh, go while ahead. They, while they type, um, there are a couple questions here. Okay. Um, so this is, you kind of answered this, but maybe go into uh, a little bit more of what barriers have you guys encountered the most in your career as a game developer? Oh, like personal barriers or like yeah. barriers? Yeah, well, personal barriers, I mean, I have, I feel like I, I actually feel like it's almost like playing a, a very challenging video game every day when I, when I try to participate in the game space at all. So it's like, I mean, look at me, I don't look like your typical game player um like like culturally I, I i am like your i am the typical game player but i want to make that clear but i um somehow culturally our understanding of like who understands games or who knows games does not look like me right so like most of the people that i work with are um in in happen to be in a male male appearing bodies and i am not in the right i don't look like I'm in the right body for um, a person who's knowledgeable about games. And so I have to fight every single day to prove myself that I know things that I matter, that my perspective, it my own perspective matters. And it's difficult, right? And just like as someone who's like the director of a games program, um, convincing people, you know, I walk into a classroom, 
I haven't done that in a while since the, because of the pandemic. Um, but when I used to, people would think I was just like another student or there's been times when I've tried to go to faculty meetings and I've been barred, literally barred from the meeting because they thought that I didn't belong. Um, and I've even been chased um, around campus because they thought I was escaping from a student orientation meeting. So like I'm just happen to be like in a body that doesn't like fit what people expect that a game professor or a game designer happens to be in. And it's hard every day, like being in the body, I'll be honest, like appearing in the body that I'm in is a barrier and it's a cultural barrier, but it's like a barrier for me to be in this body. And I have to deal with like the microaggressions or Mac every single day that I am in this field. And it's almost like going up a hill. Like, I don't want a challenge. <laughs> Please toggle that challenge off because um, it's not like I don't want to be playing on the hardest level. Like, I want to just be like on an even playing field with all the other people that are trying to make games and trying to teach games. And I don't want to be like barred from a faculty meeting because I don't happen to look like a game professor Bernardo. and or a, even any kind of professor. Okay, um, even I'm, you know, Sorry. perfectly, I'm a tenured professor um, and I don't want to be kept from having, um, ha having, from making games because, and I don't want other people. I mean, I think I created this inclusive games network that I invite all of you to join, by the way. So please DM me and I'll, I'll include you in that Discord server. I, I created this, like like Sky was saying, a cozy, inclusive, caring space so that people like me and other people who don't feel like they fit in um, in the games community could finally find a place where they mattered and that they belonged and that they're cared for and that no one's going to like question that they belong ever, that they're just there. Um, and I always wonder if I was just in another body, like how much and how much more I'd be allowed to be participating in this industry. Um, if I was just in a different body. I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> no, like, like that's, I, 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 yeah. I mean, like, like, I like, honestly, like wish I could like unzip my body and like put on a different one when I go to work um every day because i just i don't get taken seriously i don't know why i don't know what it is i'm a middle-aged woman i don't know if that's part of it i'm a mom i'm i don't know maybe i look younger than i i don't know I, yeah i, I think it's i don't know what it is like, and i don't know what it is about me i think it's also just like um as someone who also is a game designer um, yeah and and I think I mentioned this when you had your panel at Marist when I went over there, um, yeah. is just like, you know, there, it, it's not super, it's not super obvious, at least unless you look for it. And like, one of the things is like when I'm at a booth, for example, and I have my fiance with me, who's a man, yeah. um, they go to him yes, and say, of course. oh, yeah. Why did, you, why did you make this game? And then, or they go to me and say, oh, are you the artist? I was like, no. Yes. It's like, he actually didn't have anything to do with this game. He's just here, right. to, he's just here to support me. <laughs> yeah. Like, my husband doesn't even play games. Like, he knows nothing about games. Like, almost nothing. Like, he's totally clueless. Yeah. And, like, but if he showed up at an event, people would just think he knew everything about games, right? Just because he looks like, he looks like that. He's got, like, the, like man everything he's in the right body he looks like you know a gamer would might look if they were in their middle-aged area he look he's a pro he happens to be a professor um so he never no one questions him but like but then like i'm there and like i used to go to gdc which is the game developers conference like huge conference and people would always ask me if i was just there as like someone my marketing person and like no one believed who I was. And so I would have to like go through my whole bio with them and explain and they're like, oh, okay. But then they, they'll like, you know, brush me off. And then, you know, if I was, 
I remember one time I was there with a look the part, even though he did not have anything to do with gaming. And people just were drawn to him. Um, and it's just, you know, it's like, like I could, I have 20 years of experience making games and teaching games and writing about games. And it just doesn't matter because I'm just in the wrong body. And like, to me, that's, that's like cultural accessibility that like, you know, just like, I can't access because I'm just in, I don't have the physical attributes that I'm supposed to. And it just sounds ridiculous. I'm sure to here, but it's like a lived experience that I have to deal with every single day. mentioned uh this has been my concern for quite a while but what if someone who is not disabled were to abuse accessibility system and use it as cheating the game is there a way to improve it um hmm. personally i don't think it matters i don't think you can really cheat a game yeah. unless you're literally putting in cheat codes but what are your thoughts yeah but even then like okay so oftentimes when i talk about accessibility my students are like multiplayer games multiplayer games <laughs> um well it's easy when you're playing a multiplayer game make sure everyone's using the same rules yeah. And that's like, and if it's a single player game, like, okay, so there's this fantastic scholar called Mia Consalvo, which Kat knows. And she wrote a whole book yeah. <laughs> about cheating oh, <laughs> in yeah. video games. And she has really excellent perspectives. But honestly, uh, cheating as a concept is actually very nuanced. About, and there's yeah. different levels and types of engaging with video games. And uh, I should look at uh, Kat, do you remember the title of that book uh, offhand? Because I it's should look cheating. it up. It's just called cheating. It's just called um, cheating. A, yeah, there's a subtitle, but it's like it's really like you said. Like there's so much nuance. Like there's something, you know. Part it's part of playing is cheating, right? There's like there's yeah, it's inherent to play. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like you're always trying to find the loop, trying to like that's play is like pushing and pulling on the boundaries that's and constraints kind of, of I mean, the that's game. That's what a lot of uh, yeah. speedrunners do, right? They find the exploit. Right. Yeah. and it's fun. <laughs> That's part of it. I mean, that's yeah. part of the engagement with a with a, a system, right? And that's like any system, right? So it's like a gaming system, but then like think about the electoral college or like you know, <laughs> you know, like um, gerrymandering and things like that. I mean, like all of gaming system in some way, cheating. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's part of this pushing on the system. Yeah, I don't know. I have the title of the book here in case any of the participants are interested in looking it up. The, the book is called Cheating, Gaining Advantages in Video Games, and it, uh, it's described as a cultural history of digital gameplay that investigates a, a bunch of player behaviors and their relationships to cheating. Yeah. And yeah, so like, is it che is it cheating for like when I'm playing Cyberpunk and I'm getting frustrated with the game, so I'm about to turn it off, but instead I install a mod and give myself an extra two 200,000 euros and then I start enjoying it. Well, hey, yeah. I just started enjoying the game. Like, yeah, sure, I'll take that cheat. Yeah, I mean, I think the che the problem with cheating is when you start to um, hurt other people and harass other people. Like to me, like the cheating of a system where you're like you're trying to be like above the the moderation or above the um, the the rules in terms of how you treat people humanely. Yeah, I mean that I think is. A problem because then you're constricting other people's play experience and and you know you're just un unethically harming someone right so that to me is a problem but that's a problem in any community like it's not just gaming right that's a problem in the playground that's a problem in our like facebook <laughs> or twitter or like i mean that's a problem everywhere so um, school board meetings that I've been, you know, like there's a lot going on there with like people harming each other. So like that to me is like, but that's like an issue. That's human cruelty, right? That's you know that is that cheating? Maybe there's there's like like Sky said, there's a lot of nuance. To yeah. Well, it is at two o'clock. I feel like, you know, we could probably talk about this for hours. There's so much to speak about, but I hope whoever uh, the audience was on here enjoyed it. Um, uh, thank you so much, Kat and Sky, for being here and sharing your experience, sharing your expertise. Um, if you have any questions for them, um, I don't think Sky has social media, no. um, but Kat is on Twitter. I think. Yes. Um, Dr. Gamer Mom. And they can, no, they can contact me through my website, SkylarL.net. Awesome.